somebody who embodies falling in love with poetry <laughs> and representing the art form very well is a poet herself. She is Hannah Stevens. She has, Hannah Stevenson, I'm sorry, Hannah Stevenson. She is a poet. She is a literary event organizer. She's an editor. She's an instructor. She has been the Poetry Out Loud performance poet during the state finals, and she's been a Poetry Out Loud judge. She's kind of our Miss Poetry Out Loud today. <laughs> so we want to welcome Hannah Stevenson. Thank you so much. Um, I'll say that, I don't know, I can kind of speak from the perspective. I, lo I loved hearing, um, hearing our thoughts from the teacher's perspective. And I can certainly speak from a judge's perspective and a poet's perspective, um, as well as a university instructor's perspective, who's always trying to help my students uh, connect more with the poems and analyze them more deeply. Um, and, and as well, also, as in my work running um, a reading series, I, I invite uh, writers to come share their work. And just because they're professional writers, professional doesn't mean that they're amazing readers of their own work. Um, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's, we all are skilled in different areas. And there's a huge variety in uh, reading style and in strength. So um, it's not just, you know, young people who struggle, I think. <laughs> it's sometimes the most, you know, amazing, beautiful poets reading their work. And I'm, you know, they, they wouldn't go very far in poetry out loud. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's interesting to think about these different facets. Um, so I had a few things to discuss today. And is it, is it possible to show part of the video, Katie? Or will we, has that already been? Okay, I'll wait for that to, I'll say a few things before. I have just a small clip to show um, that I love and I think it illustrates uh, connecting to why we do, why we read poetry out loud, why we recite it out loud. Um, but I wanted to think about ways that we can help uh, our students read more effectively. Um, and I've seen some really beautiful recitations. Pretty much the two years that I was at the state finals, I, my mind was blown the first year because they were so good. They were so impressive to me. Um, and some of them, I could really hear how strongly they understood the poems from their readings. And in a, you know, in a very mature way, I was very impressed. Um, and it's just beautiful readings. Um, and uh, I, I was honored to, to read for them, you know. And as a judge last year, it was so challenging because, um, you know, so, they were all good. Obviously, they're all good if they're at the finals, right? They're all really, they're talented, and, and they love the poem. A lot of them are so passionate. Um, but, man, seeing the shades of excellence is difficult. Um, so, I don't know, I wanted to think a little bit about how could we help our students kind of go toward that passion um, and not just toward perfection, which is sometimes what holds them back uh, when it comes to sharing poems, or maybe even just in presentation skills. That worry, um, and that's a human worry, not just a student worry, isn't it? Um, yeah. Sure, maybe just a, just a little teeny bit of it. Um, I love to show this to students who feel, or even poets who feel nervous about sharing work. Um, it was playing when some of you came in. Really? Baby, we can't. You are the bread and the knife, the crystal goblet and the wine. You are the dew of the morning grass and the burning wheel of the sun. You are the right apron of the bake. Oh, <laughs> uh oh. It's okay. The marsh birds suddenly in flight. However, you are not the wind in the orchard that comes on the counter. With the house of cards, and you are singing not the pine scented air. There is just no way you are the pine scented air. That's isn't that it's so adorable, but beyond just the sheer cuteness of a three year old uh, reciting a poem that they've memorized, which is amazing. And we heard part of that before. Someone uh, shared a line from Billy Collins. I, I love how this this child loves the sound of the poetry, not just. I, who knows? Does he know what he's reading? I, I can't imagine that he knows every word. 
but he's so excited about it and loves the feeling of the words in his mouth. And you can hear him imitating, it must be his parents are reading it that way to him, right? Um, and with just with inflection and meaning. So I, I thought I would um, think a little bit about some things that I've seen, um, some of the nervous qualities and how they come out in performance um, and, and what we can do to help students combat that a little bit. Um, so as a, as a Poetry Out Loud judge, some of the things that I've seen, um, I noticed that, and that maybe you see this with your students doing presentations, is that the, the ones who are most nervous go into autopilot mode. Um, and you can just see a glazing over and it's, they're not in their body, right? They're astrally projecting out of nervousness. And they're not alone, that's, um, you know, we all do that. Um, but we wanna help them stay away from that and to be really rooted in the moment, which is hard when they're trying to, to remember their li lines, when they're trying to remember the poem, when they're trying to read something that's complicated, right? Share something that's complicated. Um, the, th the strongest recitations for me, the ones that immediately leapt out, were those that I could relax. It's like watching ice skating where you're not worried that the skaters will fall and hurt themselves. You just see this other piece of art come alive. And you could see the poem come to life. And I could almost visualize it um, from their reading. And I was transported. I was no longer a judge in an auditorium. I'm just enjoying this, this, this poem. And it just came to life. So I have to think that those students were really connecting to their love of the poem in that moment. Um, and, and they were able to sort of gather themselves. Um, in the weaker presentations or the weaker recitations, it was always that the meaning or the tone of the poem was unclear. And already we heard about the tone map uh, exercise, which I, th I think I saw over there. And it is an excellent one. I was That's something I would use with my students in university, something similar. Um, but really helping students think about tone and meaning is so essential. Um, and for me, that came out in the categories of evidence of understanding and voice and articulation um, in terms, not just volume, it's not just are you loud enough, but is the voice reflecting an understanding of the poem? Is it going all sing-songy and, and autopilot-y? Uh, or is it actually lingering over the meanings, right? Um, so I always try to help anyone who's I'm helping read their work or recite their work, um, that, that perfection is not what we're aiming for. Um, even though ultimately, do you know, are some of these students, they seem perfect, they do seem perfect. Um, but perfect can also be robotic. Uh, and our, our goal is really to be present um, as we are sharing these poems. Um, we're bringing poems to life. We're sharing what delights or inspires or mystifies us, right? There's a magic in poetry too. Um, so I have some suggestions for questions uh, that you might share with your students to help them. And this could kind of partner with the tone map. And it's in the, it is indeed in your um, folder. And there's a longer side, which I won't go through everything on it. There are things to just take with you. But there's a shorter side. And I thought I'd share some of those questions. Um, I love asking students, you know, what do you like or find intriguing about the poem? It was so interesting to hear about the selection process. Um, bless you. Uh, to hear about the selection of those poems. So, you know, what do you like about this, you know, student? Why, why this poem for you? Where's the magic in it for you? Um, which words or lines do you appreciate in the poem? And sometimes it's for meaning, but sometimes it's for sound. Um, just like the video that, that we saw right there. It could just be the sound of the words and helping them plug into the things that they find exciting can, can help them sort of stay anchored in the moment. And that can be like a touchstone in the poem when they're, if they're reading it or reciting it out loud and they're finding themselves wandering all over the place. Um, I like to ask them this question. If, if this poem were a movie, who would direct it? If the, you know, is this a Tim Burton directed poem? Is this a Tarantino directed poem? Uh, is this a Spielberg directed poem? What's the, that helps to think about the feeling, right? Uh, the, the visual feeling, certainly. Um, if this were a song, what would it sound like? If it were a painting, what it would it look like? That can help sort of pull out shades of the feel of a poem, which often really impacts uh, how we get our meaning across. Um, are there any spots where you're unsure of the meaning? I can definitely see evidence of this, and I'm sure you, 
I'm sure you know this with your students, that they can gloss over the parts that are challenging. But those are the places to dig in, right? Uh, those pl and often there's something really important in a poem when we're unsure of a line. There's, there's a moment, maybe it's a turn that needs to happen, right? Um, so plugging into those unclear, difficult parts where the diction might and syntax may be convoluted. Um, I like to ask them what images come to mind when you read this poem. Uh, and I even say, oh, you could draw them on the page. Uh, and that's something I've done as a, as a poet reading my own work aloud, um, just drawing a little something in the side. Uh, and I just envision it while I'm kind of speaking it out loud. Uh, it, it helps me feel anchored in the moment. It sounds strange, but it really does work. I find that it's a trick that kind of helps with memory as well. Um, thinking about the value of the opening of the poem and the ending of the poem are very essential too, I think. And um, something, a, a sort of pet peeve of mine when I go to poetry readings is, um, you know, people who finish a poem, they finish speaking their poem, and then that's it, and they just get off the stage really quickly. And no one had a second to, you know, absorb it or realize, oh, it's okay, it's over. Whew. And to really just stand rooted and think about, oh, the opening is this, the ending is this, and to sort of be in that moment, allow the audience to enjoy it. And, um, I, you know, I wonder if that's not fun for these students to think about, the fact that, you know, people are enjoying you right now. <laughs> and not to make you feel more, not to make them feel more nervous, but truly it's, I mean, it's a, it's a chance to allow us to enjoy the words that you're bringing to life. Um, and I like to ask the question, I'm an editor as well, what if the poem ended two lines before? How would that change the meaning of the poem? Or what if, you know, I, I was, was teaching Elizabeth Bishop's one art, the art of losing isn't hard to master, right? It's a beautiful poem. And we think about what if the last line just weren't there? How would that change the meaning of the poem? And it's very drastic. It's very drastic. So um, that's kind of like alternate endings. It's kind of a fun thing to, to think about with them. Um, I, I also want to talk about uh, my experience as a, as a judge, but I want to leave time for questions. If I don't know um, how familiar we are with what the students will encounter from the judges, if you have particular questions about that or would just like to hear some overall thoughts on it. Are there any particular questions? No? I can kind of just give some overall feedback if that'd be most useful. Um, what I would say, and if you just want to flip over the sheet as well, I can refer to some parts on this. So I find that, I mean, here, here's some tips for remaining present while reciting, and please feel free to share these with your students, um, whatever is necessary and helpful and, and adaptable in what, what you all are doing. Um, projecting the voice, I think, is one of the most helpful things. There are some students who are unaware that at the end of lines, their voice goes down um, and or, or step away kind of from the mic. And I, we lose the important parts often when that happens. So I think projection is really important. And especially if they're nervous, especially if they're shy, maybe they're not used to projecting their voice, uh, to, to speaking loudly. So even vocal exercises can be useful and, and kind of good icebreakers. Um, I think visualization can be very helpful. And I love telling students uh, and, and poets, imagine yourself reading and just nailing it. Imagine everyone's faces, what they look like. What are you wearing while you do this? I ask them that. Like, you know, wear something lucky. Um, I, I always use that trick if I ever feel nervous about doing a reading. It, it helps you get into the moment as well. It uh, helps you feel in your body, not space cadet, autopilot, not thinking about the words, right? Um, breathe. That's the hardest thing for, for any of us who are presenting or reading something, especially if we're nervous about losing the words. So just taking a moment, getting there, taking a deep breath, not being scared to pace yourself. Um, students are always reading too quickly, usually, usually not too slowly. I, don't, I didn't see that a lot as a judge. Um, if anything, there were just a few things that were rushed, uh, as something I noticed. Um, and noting, knowing that practicing is a safe space to make mistakes and to mess up and what are, the, I mean, it's kind of low stakes, isn't it? Uh, when we're reciting poems, 
we're not harming anybody. <laughs> no bodily harm will come to us uh, if we, you know, forget a word here or there. So we, there's the place to sort of take risks and relax uh, and practice and get those nerves out. Um, dur I would say that during the reading, I like to, I like to remind people um, to sort of use the energy of the room in how they address people. And I don't know, some students who do theater like to look at the back of the room you know, as a trick, but um, that can be kind of awkward, and sometimes I think that promotes the space cadet feeling, but if you are actually looking at people and maybe delivering certain lines to certain people, that can help them come back into their body, come back into the moment, and say, oh, I'm in this room, it's okay, here I am, uh, and kind of anchor themselves as well. Um, and I always, I like to talk to people about pacing and pausing, you know, upon getting to the stage and getting up there, um, taking a moment to be there, taking a deep breath, and then beginning, right? Not just, ru you know, charging in and going for it, and doing the same thing at the end, kind of bookending it with breath and a little bit of stillness, which uh, poetry kind of relies on, doesn't it? It relies on a little bit of that focus that way. Um, let's see. Uh, intonation, in terms of intonation, and there's, I know that there's a wide variety of how students handle this, um, and it's, it's not, I know that they're not coached toward theatricality. Some, some students are more uh, natural and at ease. Others are a little more polished sounding, but I like to think of the best readings as a polished version of their natural voice. It's still there, it still sounds like them. It still sounds like a human, right? Uh, and it's not, it doesn't have to be an accent. <laughs> it's not becoming a different character, right? It's their natural voice, their authentic voice, but polished and confident and well-paced. And seeing some of those students who really stood out, they, they shared that, all of them shared it. I think about the students from last year, they're fresh in my mind, I think about, I don't know if we're watching any of the uh, recitations, but I think about Sarah or some of the other students who I really yeah. remembered, and it was, oh, that's what they sound like, this is them. It felt authentic coming from them, uh, but it also felt elevated, so I was, I was very impressed by those that could do that. Um, Let's see, in terms of strategies for students to improve, and this is not just for students, it's for humans, um, there's open mic nights all over Columbus, and I don't know if you ever go or if you ever recommend to students to go, um, but I listed a couple here um, at the Poetry Forum. Um, that's, a, that's a great one. Um, there's also Writer's Block, which is Wednesday evenings close to Close to OSU campus, there's a great little cafe called Cafe Kerouac, and sometimes it can be fun for them if they if they love it, I suppose. <laughs> if they're not if they're not like save me, um, it it might be useful for them to hear other people doing this out in the community. And a lot of them are recitations, a lot of them are memorized, which is quite quite amazing to see. So um, that can be kind of fun, and also to I guess to look on YouTube or to consider recording yourself uh, reading work. And I don't know if um, you all do that as teachers. I imagine at some point you have recorded yourself and watched yourself, but it's so useful, isn't it? And I found that when I first started reading my own work out loud, probably you know 10 years ago, I had a, one of those weird um, smile things that would happen where I didn't realize I was doing it, smiling as I was reading a poem of mine. That was a serious poem, and um, it just would, I would not mean to be. I'd be having fun, so I'd be smiling. Um, but it was inappropriate for the tone of the poem, and I caught it after watching myself a couple of times, and it was humbling and very helpful to me to see I'm faltering here. I need to. I need to think about the tone of my own poems. So it's not just for poetry out loud that I think these are useful. Um, it can be sort of helping us deepen our understanding of why why we read poems, why we share literature, why poetry still exists and is popular today, hopefully. Um, so I hope that these uh, comments are useful. I also have given my um, contact information at the bottom of the page here. Uh, my email, you're welcome to contact me, and I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, about what students can expect from judges. 
it's always a group of nice people who love poetry and want the students to succeed. And I, it may be, I don't know, just you know, feel free to convey to your students that we're rooting for them uh, you know, every time. No one's wanting anyone to fail. We're just wanting to be blown away by, by their work. So I, I hope that's helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hannah. That was excellent. You covered so many important uh, points for uh, not only for our student poets and students who recite, but anyone else who's here who's writing and doing creative work and performing. It's really, really rich, really good stuff. We appreciate it. Well, you talked about um, the experience of actually watching the students recite, and we have that opportunity before us right now. Um, I can talk about having watched, let's say I've been a part of the program since, two, since the end of 2006, and I've had a chance to see a lot of recitations both on the state level as well as on the national level, and then a few school contests too, and it's always an amazing thing. At the national level, there are three uh, regions, uh, the north, the sort of south and east, and then the west, and of course Ohio, Ohio's in the, the northern, sort of northern eastern region. And they have a full day, three hours per region, to sit and listen to these students recite. And it is amazing. It's amazing when we have, it, have the contest here in Ohio. It's also amazing when you can sit and just absorb all of that poetry uh, on the national level. And Jamie, you've experienced that too, and, and, and Katie, you have. So it is, it's amazing. You leave there thinking that your every thought is a poem because you've heard so much poetry <laughs> throughout the day. It's a wonderful thing. And, and you'll, you'll notice that when you look at the criteria that are in your um, toolkits, you, there are the various criteria, you'll see that. But there is a category for overall, sort of overall performance. And I like to refer to that as sort of the X factor. Because there are those students who are really committed to this and really do well with it, and they try really hard. And then there are those who just seem to, there's just something, there's this unspoken sort of character, uh, characteristic that they have uh, in their way of reciting poetry. So. Look for that and, and nurture it because you could have a champion sitting right there with you if you see that just that little spark, that just little thing that, that takes them over the top. Could take them into a whole different direction in their lives too. 